Now he's in the land, and we have here, beginning with chapter 40 through 42, Jeremiah speaking to those, the remnant that's left in the land after the destruction of Jerusalem. The very poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, and that crowd were left. In fact, almost another group that would be called a criminal element would be left. And they were a pretty hard group. Now, Jeremiah chose to stay with that group. Now, he has a message for them. Now, beginning of chapter 40 through 42, we have his message to the remnant that remains in the land. Now, we have in chapter 40, I begin reading at verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar Adan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah, when he had taken him, being bound in chains among all that were carried away captive of Jerusalem and Judah, which were carried away captive unto Babylon. And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said unto him, The Lord thy God hath pronounced this evil upon this place. Now the Lord hath brought it, and done according as he hath said. Because ye have sinned against the Lord, and have not obeyed his voice, therefore this thing has come upon you. And now, behold, I loose thee this day from the chains which were upon thine hand. If it seem good unto thee to come with me into Babylon, come, and I will look well unto thee. But if it seem ill unto thee to come with me unto Babylon, forbear. Behold, all the land is before thee, whether it seemeth good and convenient for thee to go, thither go." Now, this man, Nebuchadnezzar, gives them full liberty. Now, you can see what would have happened to these people. There was no return for them. They had to go into captivity. If they had obeyed God and gone willingly, they would have got treatment like this and probably would have been permitted to stay in the land, which I'm confident that they would have been permitted to stay in the land. Now, we find that this man, Jeremiah, gives prophecies here to the people that remain in the land. In fact, one of the leaders that was raised up by Nebuchadnezzar, he was the son of Ishmael, and that's quite interesting. This one was named Ishmael. In chapter 41, verse 3, Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans that were found there, and the men of war. This man attempted, you see, to take over. And he's an Ishmaelite, which, by the way, is quite interesting. He's treacherous, a leader, by the way. In chapter 42, Jeremiah has a word now for them under these strange circumstances. What will a remnant do? Are they going to stay there, or shall they leave the land? And where would they go? Actually, the thing that is happening, the captain, and I think I should begin reading probably verse 1, chapter 42, "...then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and Jezaniah, the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least, even unto the greatest, came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee our supplication be accepted before thee." And pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. Now, this all sounds very nice, does it not? You'd think these people are actually going to walk with God. And they promise here to... Obey the voice of the Lord. Let's listen to them. Now, what the voice of the Lord is. Verse 4, Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. And believe me, they could depend on Jeremiah speaking the truth, saying the thing that he should say. 
a preacher today, in my judgment, who's attempting to speak for God, whether he's in the pulpit or on radio or wherever he might be. It might be on a soapbox on some corner. If he's going to represent God and speak God's Word, he should lay aside all of this matter of being clever, of being subtle, being sophisticated, and saying smooth words that please people, and of attempting to say the thing that people want to hear and have a little of the power of positive thinking and of positive speaking in. Don't be negative, that type of thing. When the pulpit becomes like that, it becomes weak. It becomes a sounding board to just say back to the people what they want to hear. It's a question of what Paul said to this man Timothy in his swan song, that they will keep to themselves teachers with itching ears. The teachers will have itching ears, and the people will. And it's a question of the old Egyptian game. You scratch my back, I scratch your back, we both will have a good laugh. The thing is that that is the way the modern pulpit is today. And it's the reason it's become extremely weak and has no message for this hour in which we live. Now, when the pulpit can give the impression and let it be known they're not holding anything back, they're telling what God has to say, then, my friend, I think that the Word of God will become effective again. It can't become effective today when it is given out in the manner in which it is given out. Now, will you listen to this man, Jeremiah, verse 5 now, chapter 42. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, and it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And so he delivered the message to them. He said to the leader, he called him in first, verse 10, he says, "...if ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up." For I repent me of the evil that I've done unto you. God says, I'll not continue to judge you, but I want to bless you. After all, judgment is a strange work. God wants to bless. Now he says, Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Be ye not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you, to deliver you from his hand. That was a good word. And you'd think by now that... Jeremiah's word having been proven true, that they would believe God. But do they believe God? Now will you notice? And here is the warning he gives, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as mine anger and my fury hath been poured forth upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so shall my fury be poured forth upon you. When ye shall enter into Egypt, and ye shall be an execration, and an astonishment, and a curse, and a reproach, and ye shall see this place no more. The Lord hath said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. For ye dissembled in your hearts when ye sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare unto us, and we'll do it. And actually, the people have learned nothing. They have learned nothing from experience. And now they disobey God. They'll not hear. The remnant will not hear Jeremiah, nor obey him. So what do they do? Well, God says, don't go down into Egypt. You know where they're going? They go into Egypt. So now, beginning here with chapter 43 and through actually the rest of this book, we have prophecies during Jeremiah's last days in Egypt where he was taken. See, they forced him to go. 
Now, we see the remnant going into Egypt here in chapters 43 and 44. Will you notice it? In verse 1 of chapter 43, it came to pass that when Jeremiah made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord, their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the proud men saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. Now, their whole point here is, God hasn't sent you to say that. In other words, he's not saying what they want him to say. They had hoped he'd say, Go into Egypt. That's what God wants you to do. But God says, Don't go into Egypt. Now, in verse 5, "...but Johanan the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all nations, whither they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah." Now he takes everybody, and we are told here that he took also Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch the son of Neriah." So they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus came they even to Toponies. And this place, by the way, is right near where they had been at the very beginning when they became a nation in the land of Goshen. Now, Jeremiah is still speaking to them. They force him to go to Egypt. And now the Lord tells him, "...take great stones in thine hands and hide them in the clay in a brick kiln." Verse 9, "...and back down in the brickyards of Egypt." They're not getting anywhere fast, as you can see. "...which is at the entry of Pharaoh's house in Toponies, in the sight of the men of Judah. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will set his throne upon these stones that I have hid, and he shall spread his royal pavilion over them. And when he cometh, he shall smite the land of Egypt, and deliver such as were of death to death, and such as were of for captivity to captivity, and such as are for the sword to the sword. Now, the interesting thing here is they ran off to the land of Egypt to escape Nebuchadnezzar. But God is going to permit Nebuchadnezzar to take the land of Egypt, which he did. And these people are right back under Nebuchadnezzar, only this time he doesn't leave them in the land. He puts them into slavery. And so this is the message that he gives to Israel in Egypt. Now, chapter 44, and I'm just going to hit high places here. Verse 16, "...as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord..." We will not hearken unto thee. So what you have here is a total rejection of Jeremiah. The remnant refused to believe Jeremiah. They won't accept him at all. And we have here, Jeremiah warns them that Nebuchadnezzar is going to take this land now and will take these people, and yet they still refuse. Now, the remnant in Egypt refused to hear the word of the Lord. And so there's nothing left for them but judgment. And we'll see that we have now a series of prophecies against the nations round about that were literally fulfilled. We'll see fulfilled prophecy when we get there. Now, friends, as we've come to the 45th chapter here, we are now in actually a section where there are prophecies that are given concerning the different nations round about. Because you see, the remnant that was left in that land, and they were not the, shall I be very frank and say, they were not the best people. You have to hand it to Nebuchadnezzar. He took the best with him into captivity. He wasn't going to take the second grade or the lower type individuals. He wanted those that would make a contribution to his empire, and he took them with him. And these others, he left. 
And Jeremiah was left with him. And also a friend of Jeremiah. And in chapter 45, it's a brief chapter, but it's a prophecy given to a friend of Jeremiah, Baruch. Baruch was sort of a friend that acted as an assistant to Jeremiah. He was the one that copied down the scroll that was sent over to the king. And the king, you remember, took a penknife and tore it apart and pitched it in the fireplace and let it be burned. And when this man Jeremiah was in jail and he bought property, it was Baruch that carried out the transaction for him had the papers signed and carried through all of the paperwork that had to be done. And now when this man, Jeremiah, was arrested and escaped, Baruch escaped with him. And when they were taken down into Egypt by this little group, why, Baruch was taken down there. Now, this prophecy actually was given by Jeremiah to Baruch during the reign of Jehoiakim. And you can see these are not ranged chronologically. That's the reason we said at the beginning, although there is a certain semblance of chronological order in the book of Jeremiah, yet here is an evidence and an instance of the fact that it's actually not ranged chronologically because this goes back to the reign of Jehoiakim. That was some time ago. And it was given, though, to him, and I think brought up at this time to be an encouragement to him because of what was going to happen to him as he identified himself with Jeremiah the prophet. Now, here is the prophecy, and I'll begin reading in verse 2 of chapter 45. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch, Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Now, things were bad during the reign of Jehoiakim, but it was nothing what was going to follow. The real bad time was coming later. So that Jeremiah gives him this prophecy at that time to encourage him. And here it is. Thus shalt thou say unto him, this is verse 4 now of chapter 45, The Lord saith thus, Behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up even this whole land. And he wanted Baruch to know that what was happening there, God was the one who was responsible for it. And he assumed full responsibility. Therefore, Baruch can go along with the program. Verse 5, And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. For behold, I'll bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord, for thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places where thou goest. I think what he's doing is making clear to Baruch, a young man, you can't expect at this period in the history of this nation to arrive at some high goal yourself. This is a troubled time, and if you come through it with your life, and God says here that he intends to bring this man through it all. This evidently was a great encouragement to Baruch, the associate and friend of Jeremiah. Now, these men have been taken down into Egypt, actually against their will. At the same time, you'll recall that Jeremiah was warning them not to go down there, that they were making a big mistake. And so Jeremiah actually just read their minds, for this was the thing that was in their mind. And I want to drop back to chapter 42 and pick this up. Verse 13, "...but if ye say, We will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord our God. Now, that's exactly what they said, and that's the reason they went off to the land of Egypt. But now here was their thinking, and Jeremiah just brings it right out in the open and lets you look at it, saying, "'No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, 
where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. Now, this is the thing that they intend to do. We're going to Egypt, and they give two reasons of why they're going there. Well, they were going there because they could attain their desires, the thing that they wanted, the ambition of their life. And what was that? Well, two things. We can go there because we can have bread. We can get something to eat. And then we can also be in a place where there can be peace. And we are going there in order that we might have the supreme desire of our heart. That is, we want ease. We want bread. And they had a degenerated desire. They were lusting after this. That was the result of the disintegration and the deterioration and the dissolution of the nation, Israel, of which they was a part. And they wanted peace at any price except the price of war and hunger. Now, I've attempted to draw out of this book on two or three occasions the great principles that are illustrated here. And I have warned you before that the thing about Jeremiah that disturbs me is I know that I'm missing something. I don't quite get it all. I don't quite understand it all. I'm a little disturbed with a great many folk today, a great many Christians. They act to me like they really have all the truth. They don't need to know any more. And the closer I get to those folk, the less I find that they know. And that disturbs me because today there's so much in the Word of God that we need to lay hold of. Now, the thing these people wanted to get away from, and this is something that's very pertinent for us in this hour, they wanted peace at any price except at the price of war and hunger. They wanted to maintain a position of resistance, but they didn't want to resist, if you know what I mean. If they might go to a place where they no longer hear the trumpet of war, no longer have to fight, and they might have all the fullness of bread, well, that's all they desire. That's their ambition. That's what life holds for them, and that's it. May I say that, unfortunately, in our nation there were many boys who apparently were taught a wrong philosophy of life, and a philosophy like this. And they crossed over the border into Canada. They didn't want to go to war, and they wanted it easy. And that is the thing that a great many today still want. Well, may I say to you that this is something that we need to consider. And I, right now, ask you to follow me very carefully And I don't want to be misunderstood, and yet I recognize I can be misunderstood here. I'm opposed to war. I'm not for war. I'm against it. But William James put it like this years ago, that what we supremely need in the life of our nation today is the moral equivalent of war. Now, I'm not defending war. But I do insist that we need today a heroic attitude of our entire soul, our entire being, and our life that stands for right, even though it may eventuate in war, rather than for that weak and beggarly and cowardly attitude which to avert war will stoop to any iniquity or compromise. Now, here is something that began back in World War I or after it. We must be ready for war 
in the interest of peace, and that we fought World War I to make the world safe for democracy, and World War II the same way. And we've been given the same old propaganda that today we're going to have peace in the world, and everything must be bent in that direction. May I say this to you, that I believe that this idea that we must be ready for war in order that we might have peace, and that that is the reason we should fight, is in order that we might have peace. I say to you, and I want to say it carefully now, that's a philosophy that comes out of the pit of hell. I do not think that's the position of a child of God. The important thing is that we should rest upon decisions and take a stand, not a whether it's going to be peace or war, but a question of standing for that which is right, that which is truth, and that which reveals love. If war comes, then we may expect that God will be not on the side of the big battalions, as Napoleon put it, but on the side of truth and justice and righteousness and that today which is right. I say to you that that's the position that we ought to have today. And any other position, we surrender today our nation. That, I believe, is the important thing. It was Robert William Dale, back in World War I, he was asked the question, Do you believe in peace at any price? And he said, I certainly do, sometimes at the price of war. I hope I'm not misunderstood in giving that. I think that's a profound statement, and I think it can be misunderstood. But when a nation has dropped down to the low level of perpetual panic, lest they should go to war and will stoop to make any kind of a peace treaty, may I say to you, that's the day that that nation is doomed. That's the thing that put us in World War I. We never learned. And that is what put us in World War II. We never learned. We went to Vietnam because we didn't learn. And today we have not learned that we should stand for that which is true. Let me quote another at this point. Let me quote Dr. G. Calma Morgan of England. Finally, we come to that which is the most hopeless thing, corruption of conscience, All its fine sensitiveness is gone. There is no high idealism in national outlook and national thought. Or, to use the almost terrific word of the Bible, the conscience is hardened, so that there is no blanching with fear and no blushing with shame. There is cynicism instead of faith, pessimism instead of hope, and utilitarianism instead of love. Now, he goes on to quote John Stuart Mill. And it was John Stuart Mill who took that word utilitarianism, and he formed that group of utilitarians in his day. And his definition was those who say that the greatest good of the greatest number is the true secret of all policy. And morality has nothing to do with it. Now, the philosophy today is materialism. What brings in the most money? What helps our economy? That which is totally secular. And in it today, truth does not enter at all. In fact, truth is almost a heresy, and you dare not bring love into this business affair today. You don't dare bring that in. My friend, may I say to you, when we come to that level, then I think that it's time for us to give up Christianity 
and say that we're going back to the jungle and it's the law of the one with the sharpest claw and the most deadly fang, that now it's the survival indeed of the fittest. May I say to you, then we have sunk down to a very low level. That was the problem with these folk. Now Jeremiah is going to give them a series of prophecies. Here, the first prophecy is against Egypt, and we've already seen this. God says you've gone down to Egypt because you think you're going to have peace and because you think you'll have plenty. But he says, I have news for you. The war is moving from this place down there because Nebuchadnezzar is going to take Egypt, which he did. Verse 17, They did cry there, Pharaoh king of Egypt is but a noise. He is past the time appointed. You can't depend on Pharaoh any longer. Egypt had gone down. And the prophecy he gives here now in verse 19 of chapter 46, O thou daughter dwelling in Egypt, furnish thyself to go into captivity, for Memphis shall be waste and desolate without an inhabitant. You made a big mistake in trusting Egypt instead of trusting the Lord and believing Him and obey Him. Now, you have a marvelous prophecy here in verses 27 and 28. But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and be in rest, and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Verse 28, how anyone that can believe God is through with the nation Israel and say at the same time they believe the Word of God, I don't see how you can read verse 28 and make a statement like that. And maybe that the problem has been they haven't been reading verse 28, so I'm going to read it. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee. For I will make a full end of all the nations, whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. God says, I'll punish you, but I'll never make an end of you. So, you take this at face value or not. Now you have prophecies against those surrounding nations that this little remnant left, they began to look to one nation after another. Where should they go? Who should they depend on? And some of these were enemies. But now there's not only a prophecy against Egypt, but against these, against Philistia, the Philistines, Tyre and Sidon. We have a prophecy in chapter 47. In view of the fact we'll be coming to them later, why, I move on. And then you have a prophecy in chapter 48 against Moab. Now, Moab has ceased to be a nation. In verse 42, I read, "...and Moab shall be destroyed from being a people, because he hath magnified himself against the Lord." Now, the Heshemite kingdom of Jordan today on the east bank of the Jordan River occupies the same land that the country of Moab and the people of Moab occupied. And yet God is not through with those people. I don't know where they are today. I doubt whether anyone could locate them. But God could locate them. Verse 47, Yet will I bring again the captivity of Moab in the latter days, saith the Lord. Thus far is the judgment of Moab. In other words, there's no use these people fleeing to Moab. They wouldn't get any help there. Now, friends, we have seen that this remnant that went down into Egypt, they made a mistake in going there because they disobeyed God. He told them not to. But it's going to work out not for their good, but actually they are getting right out of the frying pan into the fire. The war is over in Israel. No enemy would want to come in now and take that land because it has been absolutely run over, burned, 
and nothing in the world but debris, nothing in the world but the ashes of the civilization that was there. So they should have stayed. They could have at least built it up, but they did not. They ran off to Egypt, and that's where the war was moving because Nebuchadnezzar's next campaign was against Egypt, which he took. And when he did, he got these people. That was the second time he captured them, and they suffered. They thought they were running away from war. They thought they were getting down where they would get plenty to eat. And all they were thinking of was their tummy and their safety. Well, when we sink down to that low level and our attitude and our actions and our goals are not based on the fact that we want today to live for God and that God's truth should be our guide, that we should follow Him. And when we go from that, then, my friend, we have sunk to a low level and it won't bring peace to us and it won't bring plenty to us either. That has been the experience down through the annals of history. History teaches us that. It's a great lesson. These great principles are in this book here and we've attempted to lift a few of them out, but I be very frank with you, I feel like I've been standing on the fringe of things here, and I have not really been able to enter into some of the great truths that God has here for us. And as you continue on here in chapter 49, there is a prophecy against the Ammonites and their cities. No use looking to Ammon. It'll be destroyed, and they'll disappear because they're not around today as a nation. But notice what God says in verse 6, "...and afterward I will bring again the captivity of the children of Ammon, saith the Lord." Now, God says that He intends to bring them back in the last days as a nation. I say that these are remarkable scriptures here, remarkable prophecies. In other words, this remnant could turn to no one for help. And even we'll see they couldn't even turn to Babylon because Babylon will be coming down later on. Their only help was to be in the Lord and trust Him and obey Him. Now we come to a prophecy against Edom. He's shown that they could have no hope or help from any nation round about them, because God was judging all of them, not just Israel. Now, Edom, in a particular way here, probably occupies a little bit more space than any other except Egypt and Babylon. And Edom, you see, was related to Israel. Esau and Jacob were brothers. Two nations have come from these two men. And Edom has come from Esau, and they've not been friendly down through the years, but Edom has become a great nation. You will recall that God had said that would take place, that Edom would become a great nation. Verse 7, I'm reading now, "...concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman, is counsel perish from the prudent." Is their wisdom vanished? You see, actually, Edom was over in the mountain pass that's south and in more to the east of the Dead Sea. It's in an area between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba, down just a little bit farther. And so Edom, as it were, was in for a judgment from God. They had become, though, a great nation. They had furnished advisors to nations. And because the rock-hewn city of Petra was such, why, actually, Edom was a place that acted as a depository for the great nations. Babylon carried a bank account there. In fact, Egypt did. This was a place they could store their treasures and feel safe, because there was a little seek that went in, and it was the only way you could get into this rock-hewn city, 
And the city was hewn out of the solid rock on both sides. It was a tremendous place. Now, God is going to take away all the greatness they've enjoyed, and their greatness depended largely on the nations round about them that looked to them. Now, verse 13, "...for I have sworn by myself, saith the Lord, that Basra, and this is Edom and Petra, shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse." And all the cities thereof shall be perpetual waste. And there's no city down in that area, yet there's a ready-made city down there. If you're looking for an apartment, I can tell you where you can get one. And I think you could get it rent-free. If you went over to the rock-hewn city of Petra, you would find there that those apartments, lovely. And I tell you, hewn out of the solid rock. And you could just move in there tomorrow if you wanted to. It's there for you. Only thing is that I'd like to warn you that no one will be around to collect the rent or no real estate salesman to sell you the property. You're not apt to stay there because the experience has been in the past that the people that have tried to stay there just didn't stay. A German tried it years ago. They've always been good at colonizing But the colony that they sent in to Petra there, it just didn't make a go of it. And before long, the people scattered. Now, notice what God says about this place here. And I'm reading now verse 16. He says here, "...thy terribleness hath deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart." The great sin of Petra was pride, you see. And we have here the judgment now upon it. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldst make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Now you see they were in a place where actually they were protected. This little seat that led into the city of Petra. It was just sort of a cleft in the rock. And the Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses, went into that particular area. And this nation had had about a thousand years of history. Then the Nabataean Arabs took it, and we are told even the Greeks said it was an impregnable city. And two fruitless expedition had been led against it by Antigenus, and it was inaccessible for modern man until the plane came along. And today, you can go to Amman and take a bus down, and then you go in by horseback. Now, this city reveals the influence of Babylonian, Egyptian, and Greek and Roman influence in their architecture and in the civilization that was there. And we find that Edom was brought down. God judged it. And the city, of course, is no longer inhabited. Yet it's a ready-made city over there. Now, God says this concerning it. And by the way, we'll get a more complete prophecy of this when we get to the prophecy of Ezekiel. I'm reading now, verse 17, "...and Edom shall be a desolation. Every one that goeth by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. Now, I submit to you that that's a very wonderful prophecy. It's a prophecy that says this city, although there it is in existence, you can't destroy it, it's just hewn out of the rock that you could move in tomorrow. God says it will not be inhabited, and it's not today. Every now and then an Arab pitches his tent there for the night, 
but he's on his way the next day. They're not apt to make their abode there, and they have some very superstitious reasons for it. And the Germans didn't have that superstitious reason, but the colony that was established there just didn't work out. The man did it with the idea that he could disprove the Word of God because God made the statement that neither shall a son of man dwell in it. it won't become abiding place. And yet that's a ready-made city. And I think that's remarkable when you put that down by a city like Tyre. God said that that city would be scraped and absolutely nothing left. But it was to be inhabited after that. And Tyre is a city today that's inhabited. But Petra, you just better not send any package there to Petra because the post office just doesn't have it at all. It wouldn't arrive there. They have no mail service there at all today because there's nobody there to receive mail or to mail anything. Now, notice what he says in verse 20. Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that he hath taken against Edom and his purposes, that he's purposed against the inhabitants of Teman. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitations desolate with them. And so this city became desolate, and the nation Edom disappeared. Now we have, next, beginning of verse 23, it's concerning Damascus. And Damascus is said to be the oldest city today. Of course, there are many other cities that make that claim that they are the oldest city. But Damascus probably has some right to it. But here's a prophecy against it and that the city would be destroyed. It has been destroyed and it has shifted its position several times. But the name Damascus continues on with the city, and it is today the capital of Syria. Now you have prophecies against two very prosperous places, although we know so little about them. It's against Kedar and also Hazor. And it's concerning Kedar and concerning the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, shall smite. And he did that. And then also in verse 34, there is a prophecy against Elam, so that there is no place for this remnant to turn to, because all of these nations are to suffer the like fate of the nation Israel. So the remnant, they looked in every direction except up, and they never turned to God. But then they made off down to the land of Egypt. And it's always been to me a very strange thing how these people have always been lured in that direction. Abraham went off to Egypt. It was true also of his son Isaac and also of his son Jacob and also of his son Joseph. And, of course, these are sons, grandsons, great-grandsons, and great-great-grandsons. But they're all in his line, and they all ran off to the land of Egypt. That's where they ended up. And we find that the nation Israel again and again made peace with them. And they're still having trouble with them, by the way. Now, in chapter 50 and 51, here is the prophecy against the nation that at this time was the top nation in the world, the first great world power, and it is a nation that is to be destroyed. Judgment will come upon it. Now, I'm just going to hit some high points here. Chapter 50, verse 1. The word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Now, at this time, it looked like Israel might disappear, but Babylon would continue. But God says, Babylon is to be destroyed. But his people, verse 4, in those days and at that time, now this goes way down to the future, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, and they shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion. And they're going back there. Now God says, 
he intends to destroy Babylon. Verse 9, "...for lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country." Media Persia came down and destroyed them. "...and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain." And it was by a clever maneuver that Gabrias was able to take these people. And he did take them. And it is a, a tremendous statement. Media Persia will destroy Babylon. Now, I drop down to verse 13. "...because of the wrath of the Lord it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Every one that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plague." Now, that prophecy has been literally fulfilled. Now, I drop down to verses 17 and 18. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his lands as I have punished the king of Assyria. Now, God will punish Babylon. And now we are told that judgment will come in the future, and it will be utter destruction. Verse 26, "...come against her from the utmost border, open her storehouses, cast her up as heaps, and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left." And you can look at Babylon today. It's a heap out there. It was utterly destroyed. Now, we find here in verse 28, the report of the destruction of Babylon is to be announced in Zion. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. And that destruction is compared to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you read verses 38 through 40 here, which we'll not do, you'll see that that is true. And in verse 42, here is what Gabrias the Median did when he entered the city. We'll see that later. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They're cruel. They'll not show mercy. Their voice will roar like the sea. And they shall ride upon horses. Every one put in array like a man to the battle against the old daughter of Babylon, and it would be destroyed. Now in chapter 51, he continues that. Babylon is to be suddenly destroyed. We'll see that when we get to the fifth chapter of Daniel. Verse 5, For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One, of Israel. And then verse 8, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain, if so be she may be healed. And that, of course, again, that was literally fulfilled. And it was to become a place of perpetual desolations. God says that. Verse 25, Behold, I'm against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroys all the earth, and I will stretch out mine hand upon thee. And verse 26, They shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor stone for foundations, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. That's God's word concerning Babylon. And you can look at it today. And he continues on here, verses 36 and 37. Now, we come to chapter 52, and I've already looked at that in connection. You will recall back when we were looking at the destruction of Jerusalem under Jehoiachin. Now, he was taken into captivity, and he's the last of the line of David, and it was for him that God said, no one of the line of Kaniah, Jehoiachin, will sit on the throne. Now, he died down in Babylon. Here we have it, verse 31 now, the 52nd chapter 
of Jeremiah. It came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, in the five and twentieth day of the month, that Evel Merodach, king of Babylon, the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, brought him forth out of prison, spoke kindly unto him, set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, changed his prison garments, and he did continually eat bread before him all the days of his life. And for his diet, there was a continual diet given him of the king of Babylon. Every day a portion until the day of his death, all the days of his life. That ends the line of David through Solomon. No one in that line will sit upon the throne of David. But another line, and that's the line of Nathan, another son of David, and Mary came in that line. Jesus was born in that line. That's the reason this is given at the end of Jeremiah. Next time, we look at the book of Lamentations.